Stanford University. Professor Ross is director of the dance division of the drama department, and now, as I know, a faculty member for 20 years. Now, she is a leading scholar in her field, and I can't think of another person, no, a small uh, handful of people across the university that has done the work of scholarship, balancing that with public service and creating an exceptional curricular and internship experiences for our students doing incredible work in, in, in communities near Stanford. Now, I met, first met Janice, or we may have met before, but I got to know her really uh, for the first time uh, in 1998 when we held the third Haas Center Faculty Institute on Service Learning. Now, that was our effort to identify particular faculty. Now, she was a target for us. We said, look, if we can get Janice involved, we've got something, someone in the dance division who can do this work. And indeed, it was no surprise that after that wonderful retreat that we had at the Marconi Center um, in Point Reyes, that Janice came up with, I don't know if it was this idea, but she started to think about ideas of combining her work with community service. So it's really no surprise that she came up with this phenomenal um, experience for our students and tremendous experience for kids who in our society we have names for. Throwaway youth, forgotten teens, troubled teens, kids who find their way into our jails, incarcerated youth. And it's here that she developed uh, a, a project that I'm not going to explain to you because that's the, the topic of her talk. Uh, but phenomenal uh, experience. So when you talk with the students, or you hear from the students that have been involved in, in that experience, in that class, in that experience uh, of going to the prisons and teaching dance, dance is the, is the medium to get to these, these youth, here are some of the things they say. Transformative, inspiring, passionate, visionary, committed, life-changing, etc., etc. These are the experience of students that are not only commenting about the incredible work, the incredible uh, project that Janice has created for them, but the nature of the work with these youth in the jails. Uh, so it's been an enormous experience, um, transformative, inspiring, passionate experience for the, for the Stanford students but I, and I've not talked to the youth that have been involved in this project over the years, but I bet you they would say the same thing. Uh, so I won't say any more about that project because that's what she'll talk to us about today. But I, I want to mention her remarkable work as one of the leading scholars in her field in the country. Um, Janice has set the standard for both scholarship and uh, in, in her area of expertise. Uh, after receiving her BA from UC Berkeley, well, you know, there were some past discretions, but <laughs> she decided she, she had the right thought. She came across the bay and she got the MA and PhD from Stanford. And thereafter, soon thereafter, launched a career uh, here in the dance division, of which she's now the director of the dance division. Uh, she is the, here's the leadership in, in her field as well. She is the president-elect of the Society of Dance History Scholars and past president of the Dance Critic Association. Uh, she has pu published three books, many articles, and, and essays in leading journals and anthologies in her field. I'll, I'll mention just a few here. Um, University of Wisconsin Press, Press 2000, The Beginning of Dance in American Education, Anna Halperin, Experience as Dance, University of California Press 2000, The San Francisco Ballet, Ballet An American Voice in Ballet in 2007, um, and again, it's no surprise that she's won many awards and fellowships and grants over the years. I'll name a few here as well. She's received uh, the Stanford Humanity Center Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, that's an incredibly competitive fellowship, and grants from, uh, among others, the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture and the Peninsula Community Foundation. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Janice Ross. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. That was a very generous introduction. And you actually um, 
I think you got it right that we did meet at the Marconi Center in 1998, and um, it was an inspirational connection for me. Uh, I'd like to kind of start on that note, actually. And I'm very honored and privileged to be here. Uh, I really welcome the invitation to share something of what this work has been. So um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about how this project of the class got going. And then at the end, I've actually asked two students who were in the class last year to share a bit of their experience because this class is constructed very much as a team community process. And Al, you may not know it, but you were actually the inspiration at the genesis of this class um, because it was at that retreat at Marconi that I first heard you speak about poverty and homelessness in America, your class. And I thought it was really a model for public scholarship in the humanities. And particularly as a dance historian, uh, a little kind of part of me lit up because I thought it was immensely encouraging to see the discipline of history used as a platform for engaged social learning. Um, and I, I listened closely to what you were saying. You talked at some length about your work. And I really wanted to discover how a historian's practice could be used to highlight the less visible people in the present into action for the future. So you were, you can take credit or blame however you'd like to take that. Um, but Al's approach for me really yielded um, very valuable guideposts for my own path into dance in prisons. And this afternoon I'm going to sketch out some of that story both of the journey and the class that resulted from the journey. It began at Stanford nine years ago, um, so we're coming up on almost the 10 year anniversary of it. Now at the outset, the pairing of the words dance and prisons might sound like a paradox or even a bad joke. You wonder what are the arts, and more pointedly, the one art form that is really most emblematic of a liberated body dance, doing in a criminal punishment system that's really premised on confinement and containment of the body. Looked at from the other side, what possible connection could there be between dance as an academic discipline in the university or an art form on the concert stage and its presence in the regimented existence of the incarcerated? And the answers really are nothing, but also everything. Through dance in prisons, I and a group of 20 Stanford undergraduates and occasionally a grad student joins us, and Krista Gannon, who's been a critical part of the class for the last several years, we explore the nexus of issues that frame the practice of dance in prisons. These range from educational theories about situated learning, about experiential learning, and aesthetic education, to very powerful case studies of dance and theater artists across the US who are now working in the prisons. Also to juvenile justice law, the mechanics and consequences of arrest, conviction, sentencing, serving time. So all of these issues intersect in the class. I also highlight the parallels between the discipline of training for performance that dancers undergo and the performance of obedience that the incarcerated are trained into. How there is a de facto choreography to the controlled actions of people in prisons and how all of their movements are carefully scripted. How they move, how fast they move, their proximity to others, the position of their arms behind their backs when they are in transit. And this is a particular posture, posture for juveniles when they're moved from one place to another. These images come from the juvenile hall in Orange County, but, but it's, a, it's a position and a movement that we witness every time we go into San, Santa Clara, San Mateo Juvenile Hall. It's the kind of I'm, I'm not a risk um, broadcast of your body in that position. Uh, we also notice the distance, the way space is controlled inside the juvenile hall. 
and that the youth are told that they must keep a certain distance from the command desks in the units. This is the unit, um, what it looks like in Santa Clara Juvenile Hall. We move the desks out of the way here, the tables, and dance on that small little area of white floor. And you can kind of see a slight different colored um, floor material around the guard's desk. That's where the, you do not enter, you do not cross that space. So space itself contains certain commands um, for the youth inside. The, um, the bodies within this space are subject to continual surveillance. There are cameras, there are guards, there are viewing platforms. And it echoes in some ways the kind of close spectatorship of bodies that also happens in theaters. You might extend this metaphor of performance in prisons to the use of uniforms as costumes. Because what you wear denotes who you are in the hierarchy and it denotes what your character or role within this institution is. Now these are drawings by an artist, Alex Donis. He calls them pas de deux, dance of two, and they are probation officers with different, um, different gang mem members kind of signifying through clothing and posture. The Bloods and the Crips are at the bottom here in the blue and the red, number five, et cetera, are, are gang gang-linked images, um, but he decided dance was the perfect metaphor of absurdity for the connection between these two, and we try to erase that absurdity and say, in fact, dance is a really rich medium here for looking at the system and, in many ways, um, trying to make an intervention in it. And there's a lot of performing that goes on of actual behaviors within in the prisons. One of the most noticeable things for us in, in the class will be the youths who want to perform that they're holding back, that they're not really part of it, yet they're, they're engaged, they're connected, and they're right on that fine line of not getting disciplined because they're, they've tipped over the edge, but they're also showing their physical kind of holding their own resistance. And we're attentive to those nuances of behavior in performance. Prisons have their own set of sounds and lighting, again, carrying the theatrical metaphor through. Um, there's a clang of heavy metal doors that resonate. Students always comment on it after the first visit, as they are unlocked and locked repeatedly as you move deeper inside um, the facility. Fluorescent lighting, it's on continuously, that kind of white lighting that um, just makes everything in a certain haze. And it all serves this atmosphere of heightened visibility and external control. So these are observations I've just shared with you about space, about movement, about the construction of identity that the dancer can bring to work in prisons from that unique perspective. And it leads back when you leave to insights about the politics of institutions and design outside. And I've come to really believe that this mix of strangeness combined with unexpected familiarity, like I recognize that, is one of the things that makes the experiences in this class so compelling. Many of the more than 200 Stanford students who have taken it over the years, and I usually limit it to 15 or so, 20 maximum, enter with their own histories of having danced since childhood ballet, social dance, competitive ballroom, urban street. The style doesn't really matter so much as the sudden shift from thinking of dance as a recreational or elite practice to suddenly viewing it as a rich medium for exploring social justice. A smaller but consistent population is also present in the class, and those are Stanford students with personal histories of either siblings, parents, relatives, friends, who are currently or formerly incarcerated or working in the prison system. This connection usually only emerges weeks into the course after our um, weekly reflections on what this experience is about begin to emerge. And the more one learns about incarceration in the US, the more it really looms as a parallel universe, both eerily unseen and yet surprisingly pervasive. 
And our passport into this is dance. Now these images come from um, Ann Hammersky, a wonderful photographer who took them for the Stanford Magazine for a feature she did last year. And they are not filmed in Juvenile Hall, they're filmed in the probation school, Gateway School, um, which is right outside of San Mateo County Juvenile Hall. Last year, because of a couple of celebrated escapes from both facilities that we normally work in, we found out a few weeks before the class that we were denied entry to either place. And Krista Gannon and Ehud worked very, very quickly to get us access to the probation school which had a similar population. A number of these youths are on um, monitoring with the electronic ankle bracelets. They've either, either been in the system and rotated out, or some of them, while the class was in session, actually um, went into a juvenile hall. So this is the beginning of the day. It's being patted down and wanded with a metal detector. So this is the ritual as the, the youth enter school. And Anne was um, able to photograph everything as long as she showed no faces. So you'll be able to tell everyone shown from the back is a youth in the school and all the people with their faces showing toward us are students, Stanford students in the class. But because our passport was dance, it let us enter with relative ease this hidden realm that's so heavily policed from outside access. And because we focus on incarcerated youth in Santa Clara or San Mateo Juvenile Hall, the inside population are the age contemporaries of the Stanford students. And that makes for a really rich lateral exchange. Much of this work really is about students teaching students. The movement is hip hop, urban style dance. And it's a form of movement that many of the youth inside are really expert at so they can shine as masters in the weekly class and teach us the moves as much as we're teaching back to them. That first year that the class began, I discovered that I had actually set up my classroom on the tip of a massive iceberg, which was the US criminal justice system. The statistics were and continue to be staggering. The US has the highest documented incarceration rate in the world. On average, there are 754 inmates per 100,000 US citizens. And according to last year's US Bureau of Justice Statistics, at the end of last year, there were 93,000 youth being held in juvenile facilities. More than 2.3 million people are currently incarcerated in US prisons or jails. And over 7.3 million are on probation, in jail or prison, or on parole. So it's, it's a huge network of people who have touched this system. Race disparities are pronounced. Black males are incarcerated more than six times the rate of white males. And black, black females three times the rate of white females. So by the end of the class, the oddity is not just that prisons and dance intersect, but that so many academic and public concerns do as well. It really only is a slight stretch to say that prisons in the US are simultaneously invisible yet ubiquitous. And they're located in communities throughout the nation, but interestingly, they're usually not marked by signs. This is Santa Clara Juvenile Hall, viewed from the parking lot, but no angle would yield any big mar lighted marquee juvenile hall here at all. As the statistics indicate, what varies most are our degrees of separation from this reality. With Santa Clara County Juvenile Hall, the students discover that the com this community site where dance in prisons happens is actually just across the road from the San Jose airport, and that they've passed it multiple times coming and going to campus, but they never knew it. Usually after this class, it's a bit of information that they never forget. So how did the class come into being? I believe that the most powerful service public service work and scholarship, twins with autobiography, and that the desire to make personal passion a springboard for public good 
is one of the motors that drives both emerging and also established scholars to turn toward public service. The most satisfying of it may well also double as a type of private service. We talk a lot about public service. I think there's that private service piece that's a close companion. So my story begins with my freshman year at UC Berkeley in late 1969. In the shadow of growing demonstrations against the Vietnam War, an intense showdown developed over students and community members' desire to turn a rubble-filled lot just a few blocks from campus into a park. The university's interest was in converting it into a parking lot and a sports field. This was the beginning of the People's Park riot. It led to one man being killed, one blinded, hundreds injured and arrested, and the National Guard occupied the city of Berkeley for two weeks. I now marvel how radical an act it was then for students to transverse Bancroft Avenue into the community, and how menacing and violent it felt to have the world spill back onto campus in the presence of Alameda sheriffs and the National Guard patrolling Sproul Plaza in riot gear. And these photos here, the upper right hand corner is the UC campus with tear gas canisters going off. Um, there was aerial tear gassing and also tear gassing shot from the ground. The image on the left is shot on campus with the, um, in full riot gear, the Alameda police standing off against a group of students. And the image at the bottom is Bancroft Avenue. Campus is on um, this side, and the other side leads to the community. Only it's barricaded by a row of military vehicles and the National Guard in formation. So a very, very dramatic image of the separation between um, the university and the community. These were not easy crossings. Symbolically and literally, they were wrenching passages across boundaries between the university and community. Invisible, but at that moment, also seemingly impenetrable. Welcome to public service in the university 1960s style. It's easy to forget that not that long ago, going civic from the university carried certain risks. Tear, tear gas and billy clubs have been replaced by more subtle disincentives. The marginalization of scholarship and research coming from this work is one example. But the rewards of stepping off campus loom ever more enticing. Many of my fellow students back at Berkeley in those years used civil disobedience, the performance of not following the rules, to delay being drafted and sent to fight in Vietnam. There were no academic classes bridging that gulf into the community then. I, like my fellow bewildered freshmen, looked for ways to make our work on campus connect with the contested world outside, safely and, if possible, legally. Now, for an art history major, the links were not obvious. Until my sophomore spring, when the anti-war riots and the police's tear gassing of the Berkeley campus resumed. This time, in the midst of an anti-war poster assembly line that I participated in in the art building, I watched an art grad student appropriate an image from Francisco Goya to provide a visual metaphor for feeding a generation of 18-year-olds into the war machine of Vietnam and Cambodia. This poster has since become an historic example of art history remixed as a call to action. Back then, it was eye-opening for me to see the power of an art image to both frame and distill sentiment and this frustration of powerlessness. To feel that the arts could operate in the daily world and bring a special kind of understanding beyond the heated rhetoric of raw conflict suggested a new space of possibility. After UC Berkeley and between getting my graduate degrees at Stanford, I initially pursued a different route into the arts and public scholarship. I became a staff arts journalist for a Metropolitan Daily. And for 10 years, when print journalism was still a serious and a viable profession, I wrote about the performing arts and artists. 
I think of it now as a kind of distance education where I never saw my students, the readers, but I daily tried to draw their attention to artists and work which I found compelling, often choreographers taking dance into public spaces while using it to address contemporary issues. When I began teaching at Stanford, I continued to write occasional freelance pieces, and in the late 1990s, I learned about a dance class being taught by local dance instructor Ehud Krauss, who's here today, somewhere. I, yes, that's Ehud. And in the, um, Ehud had been a community dance teacher for a number of years in Palo Alto, and he invited me to watch what he was doing. With a mix of curiosity and trepidation, I agreed. That first visit I made to Juvenile Hall to watch Ehud teaching a dozen teenaged boys in baggy shorts and t-shirts in a dim cement floored common area just outside their cells was dramatic. I still remember the sicky sweet smell of institutional disinfectant that was thick in the still air. The boys' dancing was wild, alert, responsive, urgent. Despite jeers from the probation officers who lounged around the perimeter of the room, these 50 minutes of dance clearly meant something special to the inside youth. To paraphrase Judith Butler, they were shifting briefly from bodies that don't matter to bodies that do, by virtue of how they grabbed this chance to dance. So let me say something about what happens now in the class. From the start, the content of this class, the nexus of art, the juvenile justice system, and community service, disrupts traditional hierarchies of knowledge creation and its distribution in the classroom. There are no absolute experts in the content of dance in prisons because of the interdisciplinarity of its subject. Everyone in the class is charged with being a teacher as well as a student. Being savvy about urban, urban dance moves is valued as cultural knowledge. John Dewey's educational philosophy of the value of learning by doing is of course an important frame here, as is Michel Foucault's theorizing of discipline and punishment as historic means for making bodies docile. Through dance in prisons, the focused and casual conversations that the outside students have with the inside Stanford's, inside outside, Stanford students being outside, uh, these two groups have while learning dance actually creates little mini peer tutoring moments in the dance class. Now why, while all of this theorizing might be dismissed as intellectual ruminations, the opportunity to dance for incarcerated youth brings a rich variety of possibilities. It shows how movement behavior can be a conscious choice and a construction and success and it suggests other possible identities that the youth inside might try on through their actions. It gives the opportunity to externalize emotions. The staff in Juvenile Hall consistently tell us that during the weeks the class is running and we're coming in on a weekly basis, the behavior improves, since infractions can mean not being let out of your cell to dance when we arrive. Dance in Prisons offers a new perspective on how performance can be linked to survival. It lets youth occupy a position of power and control in a space where that seems completely relinquished. It allows one to be seen with the special attention that is a routine part of the close observation of a dance student that goes on in every dance studio, where the teacher scans the student's bodies for physical signs of understanding and success. But in the prisons and the juvenile halls, this is so rare that it is often felt as love. So what does this mean? For most people, the primary source about their information about prisons, juvenile halls, jails, still remains television, the internet, popular journalism, Hollywood film. Through the nightly news, shows like Lockdown, Prison Break, Oz, Law and Order, films like Shawshank Redemption, Minority Report, 
display plentiful media images of crime and criminals. But typically, these narratives focus on the crimes committed, the individuals apprehended, the justice served. And yet, despite the frequency of these images, the lives of people in prisons remains largely invisible. Their stories largely ignored. And that's exactly where this class goes in. I wish you, I could introduce you now to this young man, Jose, who was changed by the experience of dancing with this class for three years, the longest of any of the inside students. But it's one of the ironies that those who get the most experience are those with the longest sentences. On his 18th birthday, the day before we arrived for our last weekly class that year, Jose was transferred to serve a sentence of more than a decade at San Quentin, and he'd been in juvenile hall starting at age 15. This class made a difference for him, and he certainly did for the class. To bring attention to the unseen, to notice the ignored, is one of the most vibrant cultural and social functions of the arts, and it really only intensifies when the arts are brought to the incarcerated. The charge for the students in the Stanford class is how to advance this insight into action. John Dewey again reminds us that good education should have both a societal but also an individual purpose. He believed that the arts in particular had the unique social function of re-educating perception and that as educators were responsible for providing students with experiences that are immediately valuable while also enabling them to better contribute to society. So for me, every time I teach this class, I actually come back conceptually to that street in Berkeley that in 1969 marked so sharply the divide between the university and society, and I cross it. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I took dance in prisons last year, the year that we didn't get to go into the juvenile hall. We were working with the kids at the Gateway School because of the escapes. So my sort of experience before taking this class was little to nothing of theater or dance as a sort of form for social change or social justice in the community. And I have always loved drama and dance. I'm a drama major here. I intend to do theater for my life. And I, but I, and I had always obviously had a passion for helping others and doing things in the community, but I hadn't really found a way to marry the two in my mind. And when I saw this class listed in the course listings, I jumped on the opportunity because it sounded amazing. And I, taking the class, I learned a whole lot more than, than I could have imagined going into it. And I think, I think that also comes from the fact that it, this class sort of approaches the issue from so many different angles, from history, from theory, uh, from the justice system in America, and particularly in California, we really focused on the details of how the justice system works in, in this state. And I think getting all angles of the issue really made it a more coherent experience for me and made me really feel, uh, feel what the issue was rather than just think about it. Um, and one of the one of the amazing things about working with the youth, I think, was the personal connection that we had. We got paired with one youth, and then every week we danced with the same partner. So we sort of built a relationship over time. And we could talk about anything except why they were in there, which was so wonderful because it almost was like we weren't in a gateway school. We were just out in the world meeting this person and prison wasn't part of the equation. But obviously it was, and obviously we felt that. Um, and at least with the, the boy that I was paired with, he was clearly the butt of, the, of a lot of class jokes. And so being paired with him, it was hard sometimes because I could see him hurting when people made fun of him, but, so, but I got the opportunity to be his partner and to 
work with him on dance and making sure that he felt in, in a sort of pair with me so that he had someone to back him up and someone as his partner and not, not just the whole class against him. So that was really valuable for me, developing that partnership with one of the youth. Um, and the other, my favorite, my other favorite part of this class was our final research paper. We could write about any, anything we wanted related to this, this large issue. And so because my interest is in drama, I chose to explore how drama and ensemble theater can be a form of social change or how it can help kids either for pre-trauma therapy, like preventative in education, how it can prevent them from even entering into prison systems, um, or the post, post-prison and post-trauma, how, how drama can help in that sense. And I was surprised because I haven't heard too much about it because it's not really well-known information. So I got so into it that after the class in this past fall, I took a psychology class and I did further research into it and actually developed some ideas for um, experiments that can be done to sort of prove the, um, the effectiveness of these sorts of exercises because I think one of the main problems about the arts is that a lot of people think they're valuable but there's no sort of like proof, substantial proof that it's valuable. Um, so that was a sort of different angle where I took it, where I got to explore from the psychology side and the research side and um, sort of research studies. So uh, in conclusion, I guess this class in a sense sparked a new interest for me, but really it was just sort of marrying these different passions of mine and sort of, I guess I found in it it, or it, it identified what I had always felt about theater, that something about theater was extremely valuable. And people always asked me, why do you do theater? Why is it valuable? And I always felt that it was, but it was hard to explain. And so now when people ask me, I always bring up this class and I, and I explain what we did. And it's just, I think it's such a good demonstration of why the arts are valuable. So yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Hi, my name is Miriam. I'm a junior here. I'm a psych major and I have no theater, no dancing experience, nothing. Um, actually, the only type of dancing I do is belly dancing alone in my room, you know, uh, videos of Shakira and stuff like that kind of mock that. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, I think the only way for me to, to show what kind of effect this class had on, me, had on me is to show you what kind of a person I was before I got to it and the kind of person I became. To be honest, and I'm not ashamed to say this anymore, the kind of person I was was the person who believed that kids who ended up in juvenile hall deserved it. And all the punishment they got, um, they deserved it. They didn't need any, um, and I'm gonna say this, but I don't believe it anymore, they didn't need any frou-frou classes to help them, you know, like dance classes to help them at all. And came to this class and completely one eight, did a 180 completely on these youth. And I realized that these, these are kids that do not, this is not the way to try to help these kids. You know, this, it's not, it wasn't the way to, to strict punishment type discipline wasn't the way to help these kids. Um, this, through this class, through the sessions, through the dancing, that is what I learned. I realized that, that um, this discipline is not the form, this strict discipline shouldn't be used as a strict form of punishment. You know, it shouldn't be used to restrict them, to hold them down. It's, it should be used through something like, through performing, art, for, through performing art like dance. It should be used as a way to, as a creative output for their, like an output for creative energy, as a way to release their emotions, and as a way to be able to master a dance and pat themselves on the back for it. You know, like these kids try to, I think as f from what I've learned from what their lifestyles are like, what commu their community is like, what school is like for them, they could use any bit of motivation that they can possibly get. And if they can do that through dance, which is hopefully what, I, was hopefully what they got through the dance, if they can get that small bit of, I totally mastered the cha-cha, I could show my girlfriend or, you know, or my boyfriend and they'll fall in love with me even further, you know, and, um, I, 
I, I just realized that, that that is the way, at least in the community service perspective, that is the way, that is a better way of getting through to these kids. Uh, I'm a psych major, so I came in with the, with the, with, with the bent of, you know, um, what's going on with them mentally, you know, emotionally, what's going on, and that is also what I did my research um, paper on at the end. Pretty much what are the factors of kids that have parents who end up in juvenile hall, who have parents who end up in prison, and these kids who end up in juvenile hall, I realize that there's so much attached to it. There's stigma, there's, there's not having their parents around, then, and then there's the stigma that they, that they experience in school, which leads them to behavioral problems, which leads them. And I came in with that bent, and because of that, I think, I'm not sure if it was Chris or Janice, or it, some, one, of, one of them pointed out that you can't come into this class and then leave pretending that you hadn't learned anything about these kids in their lives. You just can't. And you just can't pretend that it doesn't matter to you anymore. And I realized that, and actually this year I tried to, um, through one of my other psychology courses, set up an intervention, uh, a small little intervention to try to boost the self-esteem of um, these youth, these at-risk youth in East Palo Alto. I couldn't carry it out this spring, but I plan to do it in the fall. Um, and that is how this class has helped me uh, realize that this is something that I, this is an area I need to be in. And I mean, all, all, all this, all the scholar, all the academic info that I got, everything, everything was all well and good. But in the end, it was the satisfaction you get from actually dancing with these youth. Um, I, so I didn't have the same partner for, um, for many weeks. I kept switching partners back and forth. Um, because of the atten attendance and stuff like that. So I think the, I had one partner for the last three weeks and I had him for the, mo for the most times as compared to anybody else. And in the beginning it was very, very difficult to get him to move. He, was, he, was, he felt that he was protected, he didn't need to, um, he didn't need to know this, he didn't need to move at all, he didn't care about this. He was, kind of afraid to jump out of the box. And um, I tried to tell him anything, anything, you know, like, do you have a girlfriend? He would say yes. I'm like, you know, she would really, really be impressed if you knew how to salsa, you know, like, I tried to do as much as I possibly could to get him to go. And um, I think sometimes it seems like it's not getting through to them. And sometimes it seems like it's not helping. But in the end of the class, I think the second to last class, he said to me, um, uh, can we learn that move one more time? I, I really, my girlfriend really, really wants to see me dance the cha-cha. Can we do it? And so I finally got him to dance with me and, and you know, wanna act, want to actually learn. And that is the satisfaction you get from this kind of work. Um, so beyond, like, other than the academic, other than everything else you learn about their lives, about the economy, about the juvenile justice system, um, in the end, you realize that this community service is something that we all at one point need just not for them because it would help them out in even the smallest way possible, but for yourself. So, thank you. And, and Krista should have a more fuller introduction. Founder <laughs> <laughs> of CEO of Fly Fresh Lifelines for Youth, which is a it's peer mentoring leadership with at risk youth, uh, many of whom interface with the, um, the Santa Clara mm -hmm. Juvenile Hall. So you. Thank you, Janice. For, it's such an honor to teach and learn and be a student um, of this experience. And I think, for me, what's so powerful about what Janice has pre presented to you all tonight is that I think Dance in Prisons is such a great example of service learning at its best. And I think it's so powerful for a number of different reasons. And I think the first one is the passion um, that Janice displays for her outside students, for the Stanford students. I will never forget when we taught the class last, we were completely oversubscribed. And true to Janice's nature, treating me as a full partner pulled me into the part of the process that I was not happy to be a part of, which is how do we select who gets to come in and who has to be kicked out. And that was to watch Janice and to see how much she agonized over the decisions about who couldn't take the course because there wasn't room. And the concern and the love that she had for those students and the desire to have an experience that could transform their lives is something I will never, I will never forget that meeting in that classroom. The other thing about Janice that I love and about service learning that is so important is the passion for intellectual rigor. 
mean, just being here tonight, whenever I hear Jenna speak, I walk away and my mind is just firing in a different way. And the books that we would read and the articles that would be presented, I mean, I'd be taking furious notes along with the students in class because I always learn when I'm taking this. And so to really apply such a pedagogy and, and holistic approach to a subject that is so powerful is such a meaningful experience for students and for community partners. And to see that in action is amazing. And I think the other piece that I'm so grateful for is the passion for community, which is what service learning is about. Jana's called me several years ago and heard about me and asked me to come in and speak to the class about how do you go in and work in the juvenile justice system. I am not a dancer. And my height tells you anything. Well, I know there are some beautiful ballerinas I've learned who are above six feet tall. But at 6'2", it's definitely not my thing. But what is my thing is how do you work in the juvenile justice system and how do you connect with these teenagers and how do you deal with counselors or guards that are treating you in, in a way that might not be so appropriate and how do you maneuver in these political systems. And after Janice heard me speak and the impact I had on the students, she came back and said, you know, this is an important piece that we're missing. Be my partner in this. Come back and help me teach this class. And I was so honored to have what I was doing day to day out in the community be validated by a Stanford professor. It just It took my breath away. And it wasn't just about, well, come to the class and help teach. It's, OK, Krista, here's the draft of the syllabus. What's missing? What do we need? What do we need to put in? And a total commitment to the inside students. What do the inside students need? What are they missing? How can we serve them? And to me, that is the beauty about service learning, is that you bring together your passion for your Stanford students. You bring together your passion for intellectual rigor. You bring together the passion of the community. And the result is total and complete transformation. I've seen students on the inside be transformed. These young men and women, it is the best part of their day when the Stanford students show up. They will wait all week long for that 50 minutes. And in those moments, our Stanford students will say and do things that these young men and women will remember for the rest of their lives. That's total transformation. Reading the students' journals and reflections and seeing students go from a place of total candid honesty, which is how I was when I entered college. If people are in prison, they deserve to be there. We shouldn't have to worry about them. We shouldn't have to provide services to, I want to devote my life to serving these men and women. Total transformation. And that's the power of what service learning can do. And so to be a part of that in some way has been such an incredible honor for me and I, such a testament to what this university can stand for, what Professor Ross stands for, what the Haas Center stands for. Um, and it just gives me immense pride to be affiliated with it in any way. So thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.